Welcome to Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Sue, a Felcher trained spine surgeon in Marin, California. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. On our last episode, we talked about what an ismic spondylolisthesis is, some of the x ray findings, the MRI findings, the symptoms, and making the diagnosis of an ismic spondylolisthesis. Well, today we're going to talk about the non surgical or non operative treatment for an ismic spondylolisthesis. I'll be posting new videos weekly, so hit the subscribe button to catch them as they come out. Let me just remind you very quickly what an ismic spondylolisthesis is. So again, if this is the lumbar spine, there's the back of the spine, there's the front. The dark line I've drawn here is the pars. This happens to be the L5 pars because it's the most commonly injured. If there is an injury to the L5 pars, what can happen is this part of the spine stays backwards and this part falls forwards. So let me just remind you what the imaging study looks like. So here's a normal spine. There's a normal L5 bone, S1 bone, normal L5, S1 disc. Here's a side view of somebody who has a pars fracture, has slippage. So you'll see that the L5 bone is slipped entirely in front of the S1 bone. So here's a model here and I'll just remind you again that we're looking at something like this, where there's slippage of the entire spine forward, while this piece of L5 and this piece of sacrum stay behind. And as a result, the disc itself can wear out over time, become degenerative, and that's what you're seeing here. And here's a side view, which is a look like this, into the foramen and here's the fracture. So here's the L4 bone normal pars, that's the L4 nerve coming out. Here's the L5 bone, as you follow it across, there's an obvious fracture here, and the nerve is just getting clobbered, it's getting pinched up down because the disc is narrow, and it's also getting pinched front back because of the slippage and the fracture itself dries into the nerve. So as a result of the fracture, patients get back pain, as a result of the nerve compression, patients get buttock and leg pain, usually in the L5 nerve distribution, and sometimes weakness in the ankle and big toe extensor. A bilateral pars fracture and ismic spondylolisthesis is very, very common. Let me say first and foremost that just because there's a fracture, just because there's instability and a slippage, does not mean it has to be surgically fixed. In fact, most patients that have an ismic spondylolisthesis do not need surgery and are managed quite well non-operatively. Having that fracture, having that slippage is not unsafe. It's not dangerous, and depending on what symptoms are, I would not restrict anybody's activity. I would let somebody play full contact sport with an ismic spondylolisthesis as long as it wasn't causing significant back and leg pain. Treatment for an ismic spondylolisthesis completely has to do with how symptomatic it is, meaning how bad the back pain or the buttock and leg pain is. Treatment is not based on the fact that there is a fracture and that there is instability that fracture and instability typically should not get worse over time, is safe to live with for the rest of your life, again, as long as it's not causing significant pain. Patients with an ismic spondylolisthesis often present with insidious pain, which is gradual onset pain, or on-again pain and off-again pain, as well as on and off-again buttock and leg pain. And that's because it is a dynamic problem that's occurring, meaning that when your body moves, there's a little bit of slippage back and forth, and what can happen is you can get acute onset low back pain or you can irritate the nerve, piss the nerve off. And now the nerve is irritated, pissed off in a small space. There's continual irritation and continual inflammation. So that nerve just undergoes a cycle of pain and cycle of inflammation. There's only two ways to treat an ismic spondylolisthesis. One is what I do, which is actually fix the structural biomechanical problem. And we certainly can do that surgically. We can take the disc out and we fuse L5 to S1. We create room for the nerve and the outcomes of that are outstanding. However, as I said before, 90% of people do not ever need surgery for this. The other way to treat it is to treat the symptoms, treat the back pain, as well as treat the buttock and leg pain. Often we just need to break the cycle of inflammation and the spine can then live happily even though it still has a fracture and it still has instability. In general, for anybody with an ismic spondylolisthesis, if you're overweight, I recommend weight loss because weight can certainly pull on the spine and cause instability. And I recommend good core strengthening and a physical therapy regimen and your doctor can prescribe that to you. 
Sometimes initially patients have so much back pain and so much leg pain, if it's an acute episode, it's very difficult to get into physical therapy. Because of that, what can often be helpful is medications. There's three basic categories of medications. The first category of medications we might prescribe is called anti-inflammatories. Anti-inflammatories are either NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and those include things like ibuprofen, Aleve, etc. The most important thing about an anti-inflammatory is to remember to take it consistently because you really have to break that cycle of inflammation. So in the case of ibuprofen, you would take 800 milligrams three times a day, 14 days straight with food. In the case of Aleve, you would take two tablets in the morning, two tablets at night, 14 days straight again with food. You have to build that baseline level of anti-inflammatory up to actually have an effect. You can't just take the anti-inflammatory when you have pain. The second class of anti-inflammatories is steroids. Steroids are a very strong anti-inflammatory. I don't suggest them taking them along with NSAIDs. NSAIDs are over the counter. Steroid is something that has to be prescribed, but something I would typically prescribe is prednisone. Prednisone is oral steroid. It goes everywhere in the body, and it's usually in a taper. I personally prescribe 60 milligrams a day, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, which is a five-day taper dose. One thing to be wary of with prednisone is that it can have certain side effects like blood sugar elevation, it can make you manic, that's where the term roid rage comes from, uh, but prednisone is the strongest anti-inflammatory we have and I will typically prescribe that if somebody comes in with 10 out of 10 pain. The second type of medications that we might prescribe are narcotics. So narcotics are opiates and you've heard about the opiate crisis, but sometimes narcotics are needed when the pain is really bad. The two general types are Norco or Percocet. Both of these are combination drugs. Norco is a combination of hydrocodone plus Tylenol, which is just over-the-counter Tylenol. Hydrocodone is really the, the opiate or the narcotic, but it's a combined drug. Percocet is a combination of oxycodone plus Tylenol, and their oxycodone is the opiate or narcotic. Oxycodone is stronger than hydrocodone. The reason I've circled Tylenol is because people die from Tylenol overdosages all the time. You hear about it. The maximum amount of Tylenol you should be taking if you're taking these combined drugs is 3 grams or 3,000 milligrams of Tylenol at once. Tylenol is also known as acetaminophen. And it's always interesting to me because we regulate opiates so much, but actually what could kill you is the Tylenol could send you into acute liver failure. The third type of medicine we typically prescribe is something called a nerve medication. These are medications that trick your brain into thinking that you don't have nerve pain. There are two basic types. One is Neurontin, that's the brand name, that is exactly the same as Gabapentin, which is its scientific name. The other one is Lyrica, which is the brand name, and Pregabalin is its scientific name. These nerve drugs are interesting. In my experience, they tend to help probably 50% of the time, and they can have significant side effects. They can make you hallucinate, loopy, sleepy. These are drugs that if you look at the side effects, you're gonna say, no way am I gonna take these. However, in my experience, if you start at a low dose and slowly ramp up, you can see if you have those side effects, and if you do, you obviously stop taking it. Patients with an ismic spondy who present with more buttock and leg pain tend to be better candidates for nerve drugs like gabapentin and Lyrica, whereas patients who do not have buttock and leg pain and the pain is probably more secondary to the fracture itself should focus more on the anti-inflammatory narcotics and maybe even steroids. For patients who have nerve pain as a result of ismic spondy, again, that nerve pain is usually because of compression of that L5 nerve from the fracture because the fracture drives into the L5 nerve as I showed on the MRI. We can try to take some of the inflammation off the nerve. One of the best things we can do for an inflamed nerve is something called an epidural steroid injection. In this situation, we put medicine or steroid over the L5 nerve specifically because that's the one that we know is being pinched. An epidural injection essentially involves going into a surgery center typically, and the epidural injection is sometimes done by spine surgeons, but usually by pain anesthesia doctors or by physiatrists. But an epidural steroid injection is essentially the doctor taking a needle and targeting over the nerve, injecting a little bit of steroid, and the steroid calms the nerve down. The epidural steroid injection is typically an outpatient procedure. It takes about 20 minutes. Usually we tell patients not to work that day, but they can work after that. And to try to stay laying low for one or two weeks because you want the medicine to stay around that area. 
Epidural steroid injections can sometimes be very effective immediately, meaning within the first couple of hours because sometimes there's local anesthetic. But an important thing to remember about epidural steroid injections is that it can take up to two weeks to work. And sometimes the pain can even be worse in the first couple of days. Do not lose hope if you get the epidural and it hasn't helped in the 10 days. I would wait the full 14 days. Again, the epidural injection is done just to take inflammation off the nerve so that the nerve can learn to live in a small space to break the cycle. It doesn't create up-down space, it doesn't stop the instability, but it just stops the cycle of inflammation. That can be extremely effective for somebody that presents with leg pain in a setting of ismic spondy, and often that's all a patient needs. I usually allow people to get up to two epidurals, and after that, if the pain keeps coming back, I tell them to either learn to live with the pain or actually fix the problem. Even though 90% of patients get better without surgery, ismic spondylolisthesis surgery is one of the most common surgeries I do. One, because the outcomes are excellent, but two, because an ismic spondylolisthesis is actually an extremely common thing that I see in the clinic. Patients become surgical candidates when they failed six months of non-operative care. So that means that they've had symptoms of back pain and buttock and leg pain for six months, and they did not have relief from all the non-surgical things we just talked about. The one caveat about waiting six months to have surgery is that occasionally once a year I'll see somebody with an ismic spondylolisthesis who has acute damage to the L5 nerve and they have almost zero to five strength in their ankle muscle. So we grade weakness in a scale of zero to five. And the reason that's important is because depending on what grade that is, is how urgent something surgically has to be done. Zero is paralyzed, five is full strength. Three is anti-gravity. So for example, if this were my foot, this is zero, meaning I'm trying to do this, but I can't move it all, that's zero. This would be a three where I can move it against gravity, but then it kind of falls. But I can do it against gravity and falls. Five is I can move my ankle all the way up, and when someone's pushing on it as strong as they can, I can resist as a five. If somebody comes in with a zero out of strength, uh, tibialis anterior, which is the ankle muscle or the big toe extensor, I start getting a little bit more worried and I usually will recommend surgery sooner than the six months time point. Remember that an ismic spondy is not dangerous, doesn't necessarily have to be treated, and the slippage that's there typically does not get worse over time and treatment is totally symptomatic and that having that fracture, having that slippage is not a dangerous thing and is perfectly fine to live with as long as you're able to do everything you want to do from a quality of life standpoint. Thanks for watching. On the next episode, we'll talk about that 10% of patients and how I treat them with surgery when they have an ismic spondylolisthesis. Don't forget to click the like button and leave questions or feedback in the comment box below. Feel free to let me know what videos you would like to see in the future.